Hi everyone, um, in today's video 6.3 we're going to look at exponential functions um, and before we do that I want you to uh, recall the laws of exponents. So there's um, about seven laws here um, that are worth noting. The first one is if you multiply um, like bases, so A is your base, um, you know that you add exponents. In the second law we have a power raised to another power, so we end up multiplying the exponents. In the third rule, we have a product, a times b, raised to a power. So you basically distribute the power, so it would be a to the s times b to the s. Um, and the fourth rule, 1 to any power is always just 1. In the fifth rule, it involves negative exponents, which we typically don't like. Um, we want to write them in a positive manner. So in order to do that, we take whatever the base is. So my base here is A. Whatever base is being raised to the negative exponent, um, if it's in the numerator, you put it in the denominator. And if it's in the denominator, you move it to the numerator. So A to the negative S is in the numerator because it's over 1. So what I do is I take the a to the negative s and place it in the denominator and write it as 1 over a to the s, which you can also write as the quantity 1 divided by a to the s power, because remember, 1 to any power is just 1. And then the sixth rule is anything to the 0 power is always 1. And then I also included a rule about rational exponents. So those are exponents that are fractions. And um, when you have an exponent that's a fraction, the numerator is your power. So here m is the numerator and it becomes the power of the base, so again, A is your base, and N is what's called the root index, and um, that's the denominator of the fraction, so that goes inside there, and there's two ways to write it. Um, I typically will write my answer like this. Um, it's just, you know, preference. You don't have to write it like that. Um, there's reasons we wouldn't uh, because, you know, we might be able to simplify it using that other um, way right there. So it just depends. Okay, so before we get into exponents, I'd like you to pause the video and try these seven problems here and see how you do. Um, and then you can unpause when you're ready to go over it. So in problem A and B, they look very similar, except in problem A, you're squaring just the three. You're going to just simply carry the negative down, and 3 squared is just 3 times 3. And we know that's 9. So our final answer for A is negative 9. In letter B, however, you're squaring the negative and the 3. So letter B implies negative 3 times negative 3, which is positive 9. In letter C, we have 2 to the negative third, so I want to pay attention to rule number 5. I don't want um, negative exponents, so again, I'm going to simply um, pretend there's a 1 next to the 2 to the negative third, okay, which there is. It's, we just never write it because it's implied. Um, so that 1 is going to stay there, and all I'm going to do is place the 2 on the bottom, and now the exponent becomes positive, and I would reduce... Um, or simplify, 2 to the third is 2 times 2 times 2, or 8. So your final answer is 1 eighth. Letter D um, refers to the um, rule number 7, the rule for rational exponents. So the other thing you want to be careful of is order of operations, right? Please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, which is parentheses, exponents, um, multiply, divide, add, subtract. And we want to do exponents before we multiply. So in other words, don't multiply 3 times 4 first. First, take care of the 4 to the 1 half. So I'm just going to carry the 3 down. And anything to the 1 half power, that's a rational exponent. 
you're going to put your radical and put your base inside. And then remember, the power is the numerator. So it's the first power. And the denominator is your root index. So it's a square root. We don't ever write the index, though. We would just, you know, not put it there. So anything to the one-half power is just a square root. And we know that the square root of 4 is 2, and 3 times 2 equals 6. So your final answer there is 6. Um, the same goes for letter E. We're going to look at the same rules, so um, order of operations and also rule number 7. Um, this time you have negative 2 times 27 is my base, 2 is my power, 3 is my root index. So this is actually a cubed root that you're squaring. So the cubed root of 27 is 3 because 3 times 3 times 3 is 27. So you have negative 2 times 3 squared and I need to do that 3 squared first because order of operations tells me I have to do exponents before I multiply. So 3 squared is 9, and negative 2 times 9 is negative 18. Um, in letter F, I have a negative exponent. So in order, and, and this time it's a fraction being raised to a negative exponent. So that means that really what you have here is 1 to the negative third over 2 to the negative third, which we don't want to have negative exponents. So remember, all that's going to happen is this is going to flip over. So the 2 to the third would go up top, and the 1 to the third goes on the bottom. Um, and we really don't have to worry about 1 to the third because 1 to any power is just 1. So it's really just 5 times 2 to the third. And 2 to the third is 8, as we know, and 5 times 8 gives us 40. And the last one needs no explanation. Anything to the zero power is just one. Okay. Next, I want you to look at this table and pause the video and write down what you notice about it. So as you can see here um, in my X's, every time I move down, I'm increasing by one. If you look at your Y's, however, Every time you move down, you're doubling. So 5 times 2 gives you 10, 10 times 2 gives you 20, and so on. So as x increases by 1, f of x, or y, is doubling. So what we have here, you think of it like this, f to the 0, f of 0 is 5. So if I plug in 0 for x, I get 5. Another way of writing f of 1, which we know equals 10, is 2 times whatever we got for f of 0. So f of 0 is 5, and 2 times 5 is 10. Another way of looking at f of 2 would just be 2 times f of 1. And we got 10 for f of 1, and 2 times 10 is 20. And I could keep going on and on and on. Um, but what's happening here is that as x increases by 1, y is doubling. And we no longer have a linear function we, because the y is not increasing at a constant rate. Um, it's doubling. So we have what's called an exponential function. And here, it's written in the form of c times a to the x. C is called the initial value, and the initial value is just where x is 0. And A is known as your growth factor. Or you can look at it as your multiplier, like what are we multiplying by each time to get each y value. So if I look at my function f of x equals c times a to the x. Notice that the exponent is a variable. Um, and if I want to find my uh, the function that would represent this table, my um, c, or my initial value, would be where x is 0. So that would be right here. So c is equal to 5. And a is my multiplier. My multiplier is 2. That's what I'm doubling. So I have 5 times 2 to the x. And if you graph this, 
So let's use Desmos. You've got five times two and then to the X power, okay? And as you can see here, um, those points that are, that are in the table are on the graph. So zero five is right there. And then you can also locate um, one comma 10, which is that purple dot there. And, you know, I could also, if I wanted to go all the way up to 80, I could look at four comma 80, and that will also be on the graph. I just have to go up quite a bit to get there. But as you can see, there's four comma 80. Um, so as you can see here, if you take a look at this exponential function, what the graph looks like, I want you to notice some properties, um, especially as I zoom in, like what's the domain of this function? What is the range of the function? Is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Um, are there any asymptotes? Okay, so we'll come back to that and answer that question. Um, first, though, I want you to um, take a look at the next examples and see, can you determine the difference between an exponential and a linear function? So if I take a look at the first um, table, as you can see here, your x's are increasing by 1 each time. Okay, My y's, um, when you look at it, they are increasing by two. I'm always adding two to get to each y value. So that would not be an exponential function. I'm increasing at a constant rate. My change in y is plus two and my change in x is plus one. So I've got a constant um, change here, which is your slope. And remember lines have slopes. So this is a linear function. And if I wanted to write the equation of the line, remember we can use f of x equals mx plus b. So I know m is my slope, and I already know what that is. I know that my slope is change in y over change in x, 2 divided by 1 or 2. So I have 2x plus... And then my y-intercept is where x is 0, which would be 0, 0. So my y-intercept is actually 0, so I don't need to write it. Um, you could write your final answer as just f of x equals 2x. So that would be a line that passes through 0, 0 and has a slope of 2. Okay, let's take a look at the next table. So here, I'm increasing by 1 for x each time. Um, and as you notice, the y's are not increasing at a constant rate. They are actually, again, doubling. One-fourth times two gives you a half. A half times two is one. One times two is two. Two times two is four. Four times two is eight, and so on. So since I'm multiplying, I have a multiplier, I have an exponential function here. So if I want to find that exponential function, remember it's going to be in the form of c times a to the x. So c is my initial value, and we find that by looking for the y-intercept, so where x is 0. So c is 1. I'll put it there, but you don't have to write it. And remember, a is your multiplier, so I'm doubling each time, so it's just 2. And then we have to the x power. So you can write your final answer here as a f of x equals 2 to the x. And then the same thing for the last one. Um, x is increasing by 1, but this time we are quadrupling. So 2 times 4, 8 times 4, and so on. So this is also exponential. And if I wanted to write my equation, it would be your c, which is 2, and then your multiplier, which is 4, to the x. Okay, take a moment and pause the video and look at the properties of exponential functions. Notice they look like they're the same um, tables, however they're not. This top table is when a is greater than 1, 
and the bottom table is when A is between 0 and 1. So this top um, chart deals with what we call exponential growth. Um, exponential growth occurs when the multiplier is greater than 1. Okay, let me give you an example. Let's say we had f of x equals 3 to the x. So here, a equals 3, and we know that 3 is greater than 1. So that's what makes this an exponential growth function. So some properties, let's take a look at the graph. If I type in three to the X, um, as you can see here, if I zoom out a little bit, if we're looking at the domain, the domain would be all row numbers. There's no values that are gonna give us any issues. It's not like we have a denominator and have to be careful of undefined we don't have any radicals, so we don't have to watch out for, you know, taking the square root of negative numbers. Um, exponential functions always have the domain all row numbers. And the range, however, though, as you can see, there's an asymptote at the x-axis, a horizontal asymptote. The graph will not go below the x-axis. And in fact, if you zoom in, in Desmos, you can see how it gets really close to the, the x-axis, but it's never actually going through. So the range would be from zero to infinity, as the chart says. And this function's always increasing. If you read it from left to right, it's always going up. It's increasing. As x increases, your y is also increasing. Okay, it's actually tripling. Okay, there are also some points on this graph that are worth noting. So it says that the graph will contain the points negative one comma one over a, zero, one, and one over a. Okay, so that means I know a is three, so it's gonna contain the following points. It's gonna contain negative one comma one over three, zero, one, and one comma three. So if I take a look at my graph again, you'll see here, um, and it's easier if I just plot. So negative one comma one third, you can see is on the, the curve. And then we said zero one. And last but not least, one comma three. So that makes it easy um, if you have to graph exponential functions, you can kind of use that rule to see that. Um, the box underneath, is a, um, it looks very similar, except your A value is between zero and one. So let's say now I change um, this three to a one third. Okay, what do you think's gonna happen? So now we'll have one third to the X. And as you can see, now the function is decreasing. The domain still all real numbers, the range is still zero to infinity, okay? Because again, you have a horizontal asymptote here at the x-axis, so it's never gonna get go through the x-axis. Um, but notice your points are not on the graph, okay? That's because they're going to kind of reverse. So negative one will go with three. Zero, one is still there. And then this last one will be one comma one over three. Okay, so um, the example we used here is one third to the x, and we said that's called a decay function. Okay, as x is increasing, y is decreasing. It's being um, cut into thirds each time. Um, and we said that it had the points negative one comma one over uh, a. So what we're going to have here is one over a, a is one third. If I have one over one third, remember that just means one divided by one third. And we know we skip 
flip and multiply when you're dividing. So skip, flip, multiply. One times three is three. So that's what, why the point negative one comma three was on the graph. Zero one is still there and one comma one third is there. Okay, let's take a look at um, how we can graph some of these functions using transformations. So here, I'm gonna start out with um, the, the most basic exponential function. Then we'll worry about graphing negative two to the x plus three. So remember, this negative is doing something to the graph and the plus three is doing something to the graph. So if I take away that negative and the plus three, I'm left with f of x equals two to the x. So I'm gonna start with that and make a table and we're gonna take a look and see what it looks like here. So I'm gonna plug in some values so we can see what's going on. Okay, so if I plug in negative two, let me kind of slide this down a little bit. If I plug in negative two for x, I would have two to the negative second. So remember, that's one of your rules for exponents. We don't want negative exponents, so we're just gonna make it one over two to the second. And that's equal to one over four. Okay, and then two to the negative first, same thing, we're gonna have one over two to the first, which is just one half. Two to the zero, anything to the zero power we know is one. Two to the first is just gonna be two, and two to the second is four. And you can add some more points on there too if you want, but I'm just gonna leave it at those five points. So if we graph this, you'll see here um, what this is going to kind of look like. Okay, so something like that. Yeah, it's a little shaky. <laughs> I'll do it this way. Okay, again, we're not going below the x-axis because um, there's an asymptote there. So that's the graph of two to the x. Okay, it's exponential, as you can see. So now I wanna look at each of these um, you know, pieces of the function negative two to the x plus three. So the negative here, remember, is going to um, reflect the two to the x graph over the x-axis. So let me make a new table. Um, you're going to, remember, if you want to reflect over the um, x-axis, you're just going to multiply the y's by negative 1. So I'm going to take my y values and just multiply all of them by negative 1. Okay, that will reflect over the x. Remember, your x-axis is here. Um, and then we're going to look at this plus three. So that plus three, remember, is it's shifting it left three units. So that means I'm going to subtract three from my x's. So negative two minus three is negative five. Negative one minus three is negative four. 0 minus 3, 1 minus 3, 2 minus 3. So now you have those um, five points, and let's see what happens. So negative 5 and negative a quarter will go like right about here. And then negative 4 and a half, negative 3, negative 1, negative 2, negative 2, and negative 1, negative 4. So it's going to kind of...
kind of go like this. So now, as you can see, right, your domain is still negative infinity to positive infinity. It's all real numbers. The range, though, it's going to stop here at the x-axis, remember, and that's just y equals 0. So the range will go from negative infinity all the way up to 0, but not including 0. We said this is decreasing because as you go from left to right, the green graph is going down. It's decreasing. And there is a horizontal asymptote, again, at um, the x-axis, which we just say is y equals 0. Okay, I'm going to skip letter B. We covered that in class. Um, you guys can try that on your own, but I, I kind of left this one for you to do on your own. So I want to make sure I go over this one. Um, so with this one, I'm looking at 3 to the x now. And I'm going to plug in some numbers here. So the same ones. Um, remember that 3 to the negative second would be 1 over 3 squared, so that's 1 ninth. 3 to the negative first would be 1 over 3 to the first, so that's 1 third. Anything to the 0 power is 1. 3 to the first is 3. 3 to the second is 9. Okay, now I'm going to make a new graph. And let's look at this 2. So if I'm multiplying my function by 2, that's going to vertically stretch the graph by a factor of 2. So that means vertical is y. You're going to multiply your y values by 2, and it will stretch it. So the x's are just going to stay the same. The y's are going to get multiplied by 2. So 1 ninth times 2 is 2 ninths. 1 third times 2 is 2 thirds. 1 times 2, 3 times 2, and um, 9 times 2. Okay, I'm not going to graph 3 to the x. You can graph that on Desmos. Um, actually, I'll graph both on Desmos so you can kind of see here what it looks like. Okay, it would be a little more accurate, but I want you to still sketch it in your notes. So you've got um, your parent function, so 3 to the x. Okay, you can see what that looks like. And then we've got now 2 times 3 to the x. So this is where the vertical stretch comes in. So you'll see the graph being pulled or stretched vertically. Okay, so as you can see, 0, 1 is now 0, 2, right? It's being pulled. So it's like a string that you're pulling up, okay? Um, the domain is all real numbers. Your range now would go from 0 to positive infinity, okay, because you have that asymptote there at y equals 0, which is your x-axis. And now the function's increasing. Okay, so we said domain is all real numbers. Range this time is from 0 to infinity. The function's increasing, and we still have a horizontal asymptote at the x-axis, or y equals 0.
Okay, next I'd like to look at um, the number E, and E is referred to as Euler's number. Um, it's named after a mathematician, Leonard Euler, and he found that this number E actually um, stands for an irrational number. So it's irrational, it's non-repeating and non-terminating, goes on forever, it's kind of like pi. Um, it's equal to 2.71828 blah blah blah. So that's the approximation, kind of like how we approximate pi to be 3.14159 blah, blah, blah. Okay. So how did he come up with that? Well, he, he looked at this function one plus one over n to the n. Okay. Which I'll type in here. So you have one plus, um, one over n. We got to use x though. To the x. Okay. But what he found was when you start plugging in numbers here, um, the function approaches 2.71828. So um, let's see, I want to pull up a table. Yep. Okay, so if I start plugging in numbers, like let's say I plug in um, 10. And I don't know if it's going to give me the Y value. Maybe it won't. Okay, so I'll plug it in here. Um, so 1 plus 1 over 10 to the 10th, okay? It equals 2.59. And then he started playing around with these numbers. Like one plus one over, let's say he plugged in a thousand, and then to the thousandth power, and then one plus one over, let's say a million, to the millionth power. And then he did it again let's say 10 million he noticed if you start looking at the values they're kind of approaching the same number 2.71828 so he found with even greater values um, that that's what it approached. So that is the number E. That's what E stands for. Even if I was to type in here on Desmos, E, you get 2.71828. So it's named after him, E for Euler's number. But it's also a base that we use when we're dealing with exponential functions, which is why it's important, okay? So if I graph this function, negative e to the x minus 3. So let me get rid of this. Um, so negative e to the x minus 3. Okay, you can see what the graph looks like. Um, the domain would be all real numbers. The range would be from negative infinity to zero. So if you take a look at the graph, if I go out even further, right, it's going to get close to the x-axis but not go above it. So again, the x-axis is a horizontal asymptote just like it is for our other exponential functions. We also need to find the y-intercept, okay? So I can tell here the y-intercept, I can just, you know, look at, um, oh, sorry, that is not the right function. Um, I need to go up here and do that. Nope, that's still not it. Let me put it in parentheses, x minus three. Okay, so as you can see here, the graph again, um, gets really close to the x-axis, okay? And I need to find the 
the y-intercept, okay, which Desmos tells me it's 0, comma, negative 0 0.05. Um, but algebraically, how would I find the y-intercept? I'm just going to make x equal 0, right? That's how we find the y-intercept. So I'm going to find f of 0. So 0 minus 3 is negative 3. So I have negative e to the negative 3. And if you were to type that in to Desmos, negative e, or into your whatever calculator you're using, to the negative 3, so you get negative 0 0.05, which is what the y-intercept is. So those two answers match up. So your y-intercept is this. Okay, we said the domain is all real numbers, just like for all exponential functions. And the range is from 0 to infinity because it's increasing above the x-axis. And the horizontal asymptote is, again, at the x-axis, which the equation of the x-axis is y equals 0. Okay, we're actually saving this section for um, 6.7 and 6.8, so the last part of this unit. Okay, I should say we're moving it to that section. So we'll be looking at applications of um, exponential functions like compound interest, simple interest, compounding continuously, etc. Okay, the last thing I want to look at here is solving exponential equations. So now that we just looked at the graphs and we looked at the properties and you know what's going on here, um, we're going to look at solving exponential equations. So remember, they're just in the form of c times a to the x, but we're just worried about the a to the x part, so the base and the exponent, um, where a is positive and a can equal 1. If you need to solve an exponential equation, there's a property that can be very useful, and it says if a to the u equals a to the v then u equals v. So what this is saying is, as long as your bases are the same, they're both a's, then the exponents must be equal. So u would have to equal v. So when two exponential expressions Actually, I'll make this even easier. If the bases are equal, then set the exponents equal. That's all that property is saying. And then you solve. And this works because exponential properties are one to one. So remember, you know, when you have um, x's and y's, one, exactly one x goes to exactly one y, and exactly one y goes to exactly one x. Okay, because exponential functions are one-to-one -one functions, we can use this property. All right, so if we take a look at this first example, and we're looking for x, we have 2 to the 4x equals 16. Right now, my bases are not the same, but I can turn a 16 into the same base. 2 to the fourth power is 16. Now my bases are the same. They're both 2. That means that my exponents are equal. So I would just put 4x equals 4, and then divide both sides by 4, so x is equal to 1. In letter B, again, your bases are not the same. But I can turn 10,000 into base 100. 100 to the second power is 10,000. Now my bases are the same. So the exponents have to be equal. 
So I would have negative x equals 2. And then you can divide both sides by negative 1. So x would equal... I don't know what's going on with my pen today. <laughs> um, I had... Let me rewrite this. It was negative x equals 2. So that means x equals negative 2. Okay, in letter C, we have base E. So you have all the bases the same except for this guy. Um, we'll need to rewrite that to make it a base E. Right now it's 1 over E. Also notice that we have two exponents, a power to a power, so we're going to multiply them. So e to the x squared is just e to the 2x. If I apply the property from the beginning, um, property number 2, for laws of exponents on that very first page. And then another way to write 1 over e to the third is to bring that e to the top, I'm just going to change the sign of the exponent and make it negative. Okay, now you've got your two bases. We're multiplying like bases. So when you have like bases and you're multiplying, you add the exponents. So what I'm left with is e to the negative x squared equals e to the 2x minus 3. Okay, so I'm just adding 2x and negative 3 um, as property 1 of laws of exponents says because I'm multiplying like bases. So add exponents. Okay, now my bases are the same. So that means my exponents are equal. So to solve this, I would have negative x squared equals 2x minus 3. And I'm dealing with a quadratic function, so you want to make one side equal to 0, and then try to factor it if you can. So I'm going to move this negative x squared to the other side, and I'd be left with 0 equals x squared plus 2x minus 3. And this does factor into um, x plus 3, times x minus 1. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3, and 3 minus 1 is 2. And then I'm going to apply the zero product property and set those equal to zero. So you get x equals negative 3 and x equals 1. And we can write those in a solution set like this. So there's actually two answers here. Negative 3 and 1 will work. So if I was to plug those back in for x into my original equation, it will come out to be true. And the last um, two problems, um, I would like you to try on your own, but I'll get you started. So 9 and 27 are clearly not the same base, but if you want, you can turn them both into 3s, like 3 squared is 9 and 3 to the third is 27. So now if I use my properties, right, my bases are the same, so my exponents are equal. So here, power to power, I multiply the powers, I get 2x, and then 3 times x plus 1 is really 3 times the quantity x plus 1. And then you're just going to solve um, for x. And you should end up with x equals negative 3 when you solve it. Okay, so you can try that. Same thing with letter B. As you can see, the bases are not the same, but I can turn a 25 into a 5 squared. And this side I can leave as 5 to the x squared minus 8. Now your bases are the same. So you would just get x squared minus 8 equals 2x. And then you're going to solve, and as you can see, it's quadratic because it's x squared. And for this one, you're going to get two answers, negative 2 and 4. Okay, so try that. If you have any questions about anything we've talked about, um, please reach out to me. Okay, hope you all enjoy the rest of your day.